Kreativ, Kreative. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today at our annual Growth Inducement Programs Economic Growth Forum. Today's presenters, Mr. Jerome Smalling, President of the Jamaica's Bankers Association and Dr. Damian King, Executive Director of the Caribbean Policy Research Institute and Mr. Robert Stennett, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Jamaica who's representing the Governor, Mr. Richard Biles today. Heads of ministries, departments, agencies and other government representatives present, leaders and members of the private sector members of the PIOJ Board of Management, PIOJ directors and other colleagues from the PIOJ. Ladies and gentlemen all, good morning. It is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the Planning Institute of Jamaica to the third and final event in the Growth Inducement Programs 2021 Economic Growth Forum series. Previously, we explored how technological disruptions can support growth as well as the issue of diversification for faster recovery and growth, which explored inter alia the utilization of cutting edge technology, technological solutions to broaden Jamaica's sources of income. Today, we will see how both these key tools can, underpin, can be underpinned by monetary and fiscal policy and initiatives centered on building resilience and growth in the Jamaican economy. As we have had for the series so far, we are encouraged again to have with us a wide cross section of persons from the Jamaican public, private and social sectors, which demonstrates your interest in and commitment to unleashing Jamaica's full economic potential for the benefit of all our people. The Growth Forum series is meant to facilitate key actors in the Jamaican economy in sharing challenges, solutions, and opportunities for priority actions towards Jamaica's economic recovery from the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, militating against the impact of future shocks and achievement of the kind of robust, sustainable, and inclusive economic growth that we have been working hard as a nation to achieve, but which has proved elusive. Today, we will be exploring the use of recent public and private sector policies and initiatives to militate against the economic blow of the pandemic. And moving forward, others that if correctly implemented could significantly aid the process of strengthening economic resilience and growth. This will be done via three 15 to 20 minute presentations from the central bank, the private sector, and applied academic perspectives. Given the importance of clarity, discussion, and ideation around these imperative matters, each presentation will be followed by a 20-minute question and answer session and a quick poll. We strongly encourage you to participate in both. Following all of that, I will conclude today's events with closing remarks, including some key takeaways from our presentations and discussions today. Again, we truly appreciate you joining us today. We look forward to your participation and continued constructive interchange even after today's forum has ended. And now we will have opening remarks from the PIOJ's Director General, Dr. Wayne Henry. Ms. Laura Levy. Growth Inducement Program Director and today's moderator, Mr. Richard Biles, Governor of the Bank of Jamaica, Mr. Jerome Smalling, President of the Jamaica Bankers Association, Dr. Damian King, Executive Director, Caribbean Policy Research Institute, today's presenters, other heads of ministries, departments and agencies, and other government representatives present, leaders and members of the private sector, members of the PIOJ Board of Management, PIOJ directors and other colleagues from the PIOJ. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The Planning Institute of Jamaica welcomes you all to the third and final forum in the Growth Inducement Programs 2021 Economic Growth Forum series. 
Today's forum is being held under the theme towards long-term resilience and stable growth. As a small island developing state, Jamaica is vulnerable to shocks and we have seen the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy with a decline in employment coming from record levels and a decline in economic output. This is reflected in an almost 10% decrease in GDP during the 2020 calendar year, reversing the previous trend of small but steady increases in GDP for 20 consecutive quarters. As we stand, the economy is projected to return to pre-COVID-19 GDP levels in fiscal year 2023-24. The Government of Jamaica's economic policy response included 15 Jamaican billion Jamaican dollars in tax cuts, spending stimulus of $16 billion, health expenditures of $6 billion, and $3 billion in public body support for a total fiscal intervention of approximately $40 billion. Additional measures have been taken, to, including suspending Jamaica's fiscal rules for fiscal year 2020-2021, payment deferrals and processing fee waivers at the Student Loan Bureau, interest rate reductions at the National Housing Trust, waivers of duties on personal hygiene products, and tax waiver on alcohol used to make sanitizers, and so on. The COVID-19 Economic Recovery Task Force Rebuild Jamaica Report highlighted that one key pillar for Jamaica's economic recovery is not only the building of a COVID-19 resilient economy, but also the strengthening of Jamaica's general resilience to economic, social, and environmental shocks. In our past two fora in this series, we explored two key ways in which Jamaica can build its resilience and improve growth, ways also acknowledged in the Rebuild Jamaica report. One, increased and improved use of technology to disrupt the way both the public and private sectors produce and supply goods and services that would lead to greater productivity and a more internationally competitive business environment. And two, diversification of the Jamaican economy. That is, increasing income sources by offering new or upgraded products and services in current markets and in new markets. Technological adoption has a major part to play in effectively diversifying the economy as well. As we build on the findings from those discussions, today we will be exploring monetary and fiscal policies and measures that could move us from where we are by utilizing the resources and opportunities at hand to where we want to be in terms of economic resilience and growth. This forum series is part of the PIOJ Growth Inducement Program's mandate to identify, assess, and share with its various stakeholders timely information on roadblocks, solutions, and opportunities for economic growth in Jamaica to inform policy and growth initiatives. I commend the GIP team and the wider PIOJ support team for all their efforts to plan and execute what has been received as a timely and highly informative series. I also extend our sincere appreciation to all the stakeholders who have partnered with us to make today's forum a reality, namely the Bank of Jamaica BOJ, the Jamaica Bankers Association JBA, and the Caribbean Policy Research Institute Capri. Special thanks to today's presenters from whom we anticipate insightful presentations. We also thank each of you for being in attendance and trust it will be time well spent. We look forward to meaningful and constructive exchanges both during and following today's forum that will inform future initiatives as we continue to work together to make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. Please continue to follow the government guidelines to balance life and livelihoods. Keep safe and God bless you all. We thank our Director General for laying a solid foundation on which we can build our deliberations today. Before I introduce today's three presenters, just a few housekeeping matters for all our attendees. First of all, we ask that to maximize everyone's experience today, please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off unless asked to do otherwise. We encourage you to share your comments and questions in the chat. 
our two chat monitors will relay them to each presenter during the question and answer section immediately following their presentations. Please also check your messages in the Zoom chat occasionally as we may be reaching out to you directly. I'll now introduce our presenters in reverse order, starting with our final presenter, Dr. Damian King. Damian is the Executive Director of the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, CAPRI, and also teaches economics at the University of the West Indies Jamaica campus. He serves on many corporate boards, both public and private sector, and has written, supervised, and published academic work and policy papers in the areas of sovereign debt, economic modeling, international trade, financial inclusion, amongst others. He's also the author and editor, along with Dr. David Tennant, of Debt and Development in Small Island Develop Developing Nations. He earned a BA from York University in Canada and an MSc from the University of the West Indies, Jamaica, and a PhD from New York University in the States. Damon is widely known to be forthright. However, he claims he enjoys watching West Indies cricket, which given the performance of the team for the past many years, I find kind of hard to believe. Nevertheless, we'll hear some straight talk from Damien later on in the program. Our second presenter will be Mr. Jerome Smalling, who is a seasoned financial expert with an esteemed 25 year career in banking, spanning the Caribbean and North America. He's currently the president of the Jamaica Bankers Association and CEO of JMMB Bank with responsibility for their banks in the Dominican Republic and Trinidad and Tobago. Jerome successfully guided GMMB through the application process for the upgrade from its merchant banking license to a commercial banking license. And with customer focus, innovation, and technology at the forefront of his mandate, improvements in the bank's operations and service delivery has enabled it now to be the fastest growing bank in Jamaica. Jerome holds an MBA and a bachelor's degree in business and professional management from Nova Southwestern University in the United States. He's also a fellow of the Institute of Canadian Bankers and completed executive training at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton Business School. He serves on a number of boards, including that of his alma mater, Monroe College. We appreciate him being here to share the measures undertaken and being proposed by banks in Jamaica to rebound and drive Jamaica's economic growth far beyond the impact of the pandemic. First, however, we'll be hearing from the governor of the Bank of Jamaica, Mr. Richard Biles, who has over three decades of senior level management experience in the financial sector. Being appointed governor of the central bank in, before he was appointed governor of the central bank in August 2019, he served as chairman of the Sagicor Group, Jamaica Limited, following 13 successful years as its president and CEO. Prior to this tenure at Sagicor, Mr. Bile served as president and CEO of Panjam Investments Limited, also for 13 years. He also served on a number of other prominent corporate boards. His prior public sector service includes serving as the first private sector co-chairman of the Jamaica's landmark economic program oversight committee known to most of us as EPOC. Mr. Biles holds a BSc in economics from the University of the West Indies Mona and an MSc in National Development from the University of Bradford, England. He was awarded the Doctor of Humane Letters from the Northern Caribbean University and the Doctor of Business from University College of the Caribbean, UCC. He's also an inductee to the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica's Hall of Fame and has been recognized by both the Observer and the Gleaner publications for his work as a private sector business leader. Lest my introduction outstrips the duration of his speech, let me now turn over to our governor.
Well, thank you, Planning Institute of Jamaica, on behalf of the Bank of Jamaica for inviting us to participate in this seminar. We really appreciate the invitation. The situation in Jamaica is that we have had a long-standing challenge in growing above 1%. And indeed, over the last five years, we haven't done much better than that. And this puts us well behind the averages for other developing economies and our main trading partners. It's against that backdrop that we face the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I want to do this afternoon is address you in three stages. Look at the impact of COVID-19 on the Jamaican economy, the shock it caused. Uh, talk about the policy initiatives that the Bank of Jamaica took to ensure there was adequate liquidity in the financial system. And then to speak uh, briefly on the growth impediments, uh, the opportunities and the policy lessons out of this experience. So the pandemic severely impacted the domestic economy, as we all know. Uh, it had a very severe impact on Jamaica. Immediately in the first quarter, June, we uh, enacted very strict stringency measures uh, to safeguard the, the distancing between people. And that had a severe impact on production and economic activities in key sectors of the economy. Indeed, the tourism sector uh, came to a virtual halt at the start of the pandemic. Luckily for Jamaica, we had certain buffers in place. The government of Jamaica had bank balances in excess of 87 billion. Uh, Jamaica had gross reserves at the end of February of approximately 3.6 billion US dollars. And Bank of Jamaica's policy rate uh, had been reduced over consecutive uh, quarters to a historic low of 0.5%, and that gave strong support to credit and GDP expansion. These buffers allowed the government and bank to respond pretty quickly and effectively to the significant fallout due to the pandemic. The COVID-19 impact on domestic GDP was quite considerable. We went from expecting growth of about 0.5 to 1.5 percent for financial year 2021 to our current view, which is that there will be a contraction in a range of 10 to 12 percent for that same year. Indeed, uh, COVID-19 has resulted in Jamaica's largest contraction in real GDP, uh, certainly for in the recorded uh, economic history of the country. The labor market too uh, suffered significantly. Uh, we went from uh, employment, uh, unemployment rate of 7.3% in about January, February of 2020, all the way up to 12.6% by July, falling to 10.7% in October and moderating even further to 8.9% in January. But we still stand almost 2% above where we were pre-pandemic. External accounts, however, have remained pretty resilient. Uh, Jamaica's current account deficit is expected to stay at a sustainable level of about 1 to 3 percent of GDP for this financial year. And this has been possible because of strong remittance inflows and also a very notable fall in imports, in particular uh, oil volumes and price, as well as general consumer imports. For the first 11 months of financial year 2021, gross remittance inflows totaled 2.8 billion, which is far in excess of any 12 month period prior to this. The foreign exchange market too has remained pretty stable. Um, devaluing or depreciating by about 6.5% in the financial year 2020-21. And when you think of it, in a year that there was this absolute shutdown for us to have depreciated by only 6.5%, which is just a little more than a 4% of the previous year, that's quite a considerable achievement. Inflation also uh, has remained pretty well behaved. 
at April of this year, uh, the last 12 month period, we experienced inflation of 3.8%, which is pretty low. Indeed, over the past 40 months, inflation has been below 6%, which is the upper limit of our 4 to 6% corridor. And we have, we have hit, we have, we have come in under that 6%, 38 occasions of the 40, which is a 95% success rate. To the extent that we have uh, exceeded that on one or two occasions, it's been really due to temporary increases in agricultural prices. Similarly, when we have been under the 4% lower limit uh, on the 15 occasions that we have been, it's been mainly due to a volatility in agricultural prices and on some occasions declines in international oil prices. When we look at the uh, DTIs, uh, what we see is a deceleration in loan growth and we can well understand that. Uh, at about January, February, uh, just prior to the pandemic, we were uh, steaming ahead at about 18.2% year on year growth in business loans. That has fallen to 11% at March of this year. And personal loans were uh, at about 15.3% and those have fallen dramatically to 7.3%. Uh, and of course, the loan book has worsened slightly since the pandemic, but not to the extent that we feel it can't be managed by the DTIs. When we look at the initiatives that BOJ took to ensure adequate foreign exchange liquidity, there were several. Firstly, we introduced the concept of foreign exchange swaps into the market. So we had swaps between BOJ and the DTIs and between DTIs themselves. Of course, we intervened with sales through the BFIXIT system several times in a period. We did direct sales to the energy sector. Uh, we reduced the foreign exchange cash reserves at DTIs are required to carry out the Bank of Jamaica and this gave them, gave them greater access to foreign currency. And we provided a US dollar repurchase facility for the DTIs. So if they had US dollar uh, uh, assets, they could come and repo it with us. Total foreign exchange liquidity support provided by the bank since the beginning of the pandemic is approximately 1.3 billion US or about nine and a half percent of GDP. Looking on the Jamaican dollar liquidity side, we again reduced the cash reserve held by DTIs at BOJ. We had a special bond buying program for GOG and BOJ securities. Uh, we removed the limit on the amount that DTIs can borrow overnight from Bank of Jamaica. Uh, we reintroduced a lending facility to the DTIs, reactivated the emergency liquidity facility, and we had a special loan facility to credit unions. We also reactivated a intermediate uh, intermediation facility between DTIs. Total liquidity support that we gave to the market uh, was 83.8 billion, or about 4.3% of GDP. So when you add the Jamaican dollar liquidity support to the US dollar liquidity support, it turns out to be quite substantial, well above 13.8% uh, of GDP. Other BOJ initiatives in response to the pandemic was uh, we held discussions and had agreement with the financial holding companies uh, to make only limited dividend distributions up to the end of March 21. So they made distributions only to shareholders at 1% or less of their shareholder register. Um, and we only lifted that in April of 2021. And what that did was allow the DTIs and the financial holding companies to accumulate cash uh, within their organization. Financial institutions, as you well know, also played a big role in seeking to ease the burden on customers. Uh, they had a moratorium facility, uh, which amounted to about 210 billion 
dollars uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. At February of this year, that stock outstanding is now about 65 billion and really speaks to the improvement in credit facilities and the economic situation in the period since the beginning of the pandemic and uh, the end of February. In all of this, the banks also sought to be more assertive in implementing tiered KYC for banks to try to pull into the financial network uh, low risk but unbanked individuals. And of course, we stepped up our initiative to launch a central bank digital currency, uh, which has the and will have the effect of being far more inclusive, bringing in a lot of unbanked individuals uh, into the financial network in a digital manner. Growth impediments and opportunities. Let's talk a little bit uh, about that before we close off. I think that one of the uh, clear things is that uh, we expect the recovery in GDP to be pretty strong in the financial year 2021 to 22. And we expect that to be in a range of about five to eight percent. Uh, thereafter, though, we expect medium term growth to settle down to about two to four percent. We feel, we estimate that the risk is on the downward side to Jamaica's long-term growth, uh, given uh, our historical background, but also the scars left by COVID-19. In particular, the scars on our educational system that may have severely impeded at least one year cohort uh, of students at pretty much all levels in our educational system. What are some of the lessons that we have learned from this crisis? Well, obviously I think that there is a greater need for financial inclusion and digitization of the Jamaican economy. Just a simple act of trying to get uh, government support out to those who are most in need became very difficult because so many Jamaicans are not part of the financial network and also because a lot of the banking is still not digitized. Uh, and that is one of the objectives that we hope to cure with the central bank digital currency. Looking a little bit more strategically uh, down the road at growth, I think that the usual suspects uh, of what it is that impedes growth in Jamaica remain. Uh, for example, there is still further work for us to do in the improving the business environment and boosting competitiveness. There is a lot of work to be done in reforming criminal justice and trying to get a handle on crime. Uh, certainly access to uh, sorry, access to financial reforms, access to financial, we, financials, financial system. We need reforms in that area. Um, and of course, any strategic and targeted investment projects um, would certainly help to boost growth. But I think that for me, a main concern is that we need to improve the quality of and productivity of Jamaicans. Although over the last five years, maybe longer, we have been creating quite a few jobs. The jobs are essentially uh, low value added jobs. Um, and therefore the impact on GDP is quite constrained. And I think that's one of the reasons why we can't get over that 2% hurdle. We need to step back and take a medium term look at this problem. What we need is to start producing cohort after cohort of highly trained Jamaicans in the fields that a modern economy demands the most, science, technology, that kind of stuff. Uh, but to do so, we need to start with the foundations. We need the institutions, we need the teachers, the curriculum, and then we need to start recruiting, preserving those students in the institutions and eventually 
turning them out year by year. It's a long process, but we have to start somewhere. And if you just look around at countries of our size and with our kind of resources, our natural resources, uh, you see that the level of education and the value added that citizens bring to the table is greatly enhanced when we have uh, much improved educational in set of institutions and we produce graduates that are far more productive. So I want to commend that uh, to uh, the government of Jamaica and Bank of Jamaica is of course more than prepared to play its role in that respect. Uh, inflation, uh, we intend to keep it low and stable and very predictable over the uh, medium term. Uh, the financial system, sound as it is now, we intend to be very careful to make sure it stays sound and we expect to help in making sure the country's debt levels are at sustainable levels. We really uh, want to encourage the private sector, as they have been, to continue to be proactive in seeking out opportunities to innovate and to encourage greater economic activity. We're all working together for recovery of Jamaica. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We thank Mr. Biles for that comprehensive presentation. Unfortunately, he was unable to be with us this morning, but we are fortunate to have Deputy Governor, Mr. Robert Stennett, who will be addressing your questions now. Please remember to write your questions and comments in the Zoom chat and our two chat monitors will relay them for you. Just to say that Mr. Stennett has held a number of positions at the Central Bank over many years, including, but not limited to, head of its research and economic program division and senior financial analyst in the governor's office to support the formulation and implementation of monetary policy. He is trained in advanced econometrics, financial programming and econometric modeling and has graciously agreed to be here to address your questions in relation to today's discussions. To get the ball rolling, Mr. Stennett, thank you again for being here. Just a quick question. Um, Jamaica has achieved macroeconomic stability for some time, yet significant economic growth remains elusive. The central bank has been optimistic about Jamaica's economic forecast, even while recovering from the pandemic. Are there credible signs that we will be able to transition to significant economic growth? If so, how and when? All right, thank you. Thank you, moderator. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me again just reiterate the governor's apologies for not being able to be present this morning. Um, unfortunately, the dictates of duty require him to be elsewhere, and I do hope that I will um, at least be able to, to stand in his shoe. I thought his presentation was very comprehensive. Uh, so, moderator, to your question um, about the fact that we remain stable and the, the question as to whether or not this underpins the emergence of growth, I think the best way to start is to make the observation that stability is a necessary, but it is not a sufficient condition for economic growth. I think the governor went into some detail just now outlining the range of initiatives or issues that Jamaica will have to uh, grapple with in order to move us from the current very slow state of growth to one in which um, we will all be rich over, over the short term. Uh, the, the, the path that the governor outlined in his presentation is really over the short term. What is happening is that the economy took a big hit in 2021 and the, the type of growth that he painted, um, uh, the, the, the increase in the range five to 8% for the next year and over the next two years, increases in the range of two to 4%, um, are really just recovery um, of what we lost in the context of the pandemic. And it, 
those numbers really do not point to any strong underpinnings um, of growth. And so, you know, the, 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 the issue is that we have battled um, the pandemic while at the same time maintaining a very strict eye on stability. So the, the fiscal authorities have clearly signaled that the fiscal anchors remain in place. And I think the central bank has also emphasized that it continues to emphasize price stability and financial stability in ensuring that the economy is going to be at a stage where it will be able to rebound sustainably over the medium term. But at the same time, this type of short-term recovery and the, the anchors that need to be in place to maintain stability are not sufficient for the economy to grow. Uh, the governor spoke to some of the factors and he also spoke to some of the issues of scarring in the economy. But I would think that the principal challenge for Jamaica is to attract the level and quantum of investments that is going to build back a capital stock that has been significantly eroded over time. And that will allow the country to really, to really move into a state of higher growth. So, so I, think, I think that is essentially the problem. Uh, related to that, of course, are going to be all the other things that the governor spoke to, the lift in the quality and quantity of the labor force, um, particularly in the context of the scars that, that the pandemic would have brought. Um, ensuring that overall there is a plan, a coherent plan involving all stakeholders in the economy to move uh, the needle meaningfully along a path that all stakeholders are confident in going towards. So in a, in a nutshell, um, moderator, I would say that the, the, the very near term is about recovery, but we still have a lot of challenge in taking us forward um, to enjoy higher sustained economic growth over the over the long term. Thank you so much, Mr. Stennett. Uh, we have Mr. Dennis Chong online with us. I am not sure if your answer fully covered his question here. Mr. Chong, would you like to open your mic and your camera and just ask your question directly? Okay, um, you can hear me, right? I'm trying to open the camera, but I don't, I don't know. So I can't start it. Um, it's fine, we can then, hear you clearly. All right. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting presentation by the governor and the, the one, the, the slide that actually caught my attention, which I think he hit the nail on the head. And I think Mr. Senate just answered it also, is that the environment is going to be critical. Um, the primary issue we've been facing as I said, since 1972 that has affected us is declining labor productivity because that's really our only value added um, that we can get economic growth from. And with maybe only in the 80s, the early 80s, we had increases in, in labor productivity. In 2013, the IMF agreement, which we've done well with, um, stated labor market reform as a critical component of putting us on the path to growth, which is why we can't get past 1% unless we do that. But we, we seem to have only given lip service to it from a fiscal point of view. And I mean, I know that the governor mentioned it, but governor really deals with monetary policy. And we have not been able to address that labor market reform issue. I remember it's, it's from, the, I was at PSOJ that they've been setting up some committee to deal with it. Is there a timeline for addressing these things? Because unless, as the governor said, we get this environment right, then we will not even see 2% growth after we have you know, recovered with, with the 5%. And therefore, I think that is critical in terms of a timeline for execution to communicate to us, the productive sector, so that we can develop some confidence in the policies and, and you know, that will also develop confidence in the investing community and the, the investments that you're looking for from overseas. So I don't know if you could answer that for me. <laughs> Thanks for that question, Mr. Chog. Um, I thought I saw in the chat where somebody um, is contending that Bank of Jamaica cannot possibly answer that question. 
and clearly uh the, the the essence of your question we we have no idea we don't we don't know what the exact plans are in the relevant corridors of power to address labor market issues but what i can do is i can agree with you um that this is a is a major issue in jamaica's growth problem the the observations of the central bank are that this features in low factor productivity growth our by our calculations factor productivity either has declined over the past 10 or so years or in the more recent time has not grown substantially at all um the the covid pandemic has introduced another element into the problem in the sense that the quality of the labor force is likely to be significantly well at least not not necessarily significantly is likely without further intervention to be impaired if we don't bring the children that have been so affected by the pandemic back up the learning curve in a in a in a in a reasonable time to ensure that that cohort of population um, enters into the labor force um, and be and be productive the 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 challenge however really remains about resource constraints um the government i'm sure is aware of the challenges it will need to uh, undertake the relevant expenditure in a timely manner to address the quality of the labor force and there are going to be some related issues that the government is going to have to ensure are in place to build productivity i mean crime and violence is a clear is a clear complementary factor or a clear in hindering factor to to productivity growth but the best that we can do is is agree with you that this represents a major challenge for jamaica going forward and represents one of those things that will we, we as a country will have to address in order to to engender um long-run growth but but unfortunately boj doesn't doesn't know much more than you in relation to this but thanks for the question thanks so much uh, mr senate mr chong stick around dr king says that he has a different take on it in his presentation later today and i'm sure you can quiz him more about it um, later today so thanks so much i'm now going to turn over to mrs kellyanne Murray, or chat monitor who is going to be directing some other questions to mr Stennett. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. And further to your point, Laura, I would just ask Mr. Bailey to wait until Damon King's presentation to answer his question on what specific labor market reforms are needed. And that's in relation to Dennis Chung, Dennis Chung's question. Mr. Stennett, as it relates to Jamaica's gray listing status with the UK and the EU, what are the implications and the way forward for Jamaica? All right, thanks. Thanks for that question. Very, very interesting and timely one. Um, let me start by saying that I think Jamaica was placed on a gray list, on the FATF gray list in January of last year. Um, it sounds bad, but it is not actually as bad as it sounds. Why? A gray list is really a list of countries for whom the FATF have, have identified what they call strategic deficiencies in the country's AML safety infrastructure and require essentially the countries to move um, these deficiencies to a point of compliance in relation to um, the risk that they pose for facilitating um, um, money laundering. The key, however, about um, about the gray list is that it really represents an acknowledgement that the countries are willing and able to be work to work with the FATF in addressing these deficiencies. So the fact that Jamaica is on a gray list, uh, while it sounds unnerving, is really an, a signal to the rest of the world that Jamaica is actively complying with the FATF in addressing these deficiencies. The FATF does not, when a gray list is published, require its member countries to apply any enhanced due diligence measures to these jurisdictions unless of course there is one and two there there are one and one or two institutions say for example a correspondent bank that that believes that with the with the publishing the gray list that their exposure to the country may be jeopardized but there is no concerted 
or directed due diligence that is, that is applied to the particular country. Now, in recognition of the, the inclusion of Jamaica on the gray list, we have not been sitting down and, um, and taking it lightly. We have actually engaged with, 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 with the FATF, and I think it was December of last year, we actually reapplied to, to the FATF for a technical re-rating. Um, for, for us to be compliant, we need to, we need to be at least compliant in 32 areas of the 40 areas that the FATF outlines. And so far, we are compliant or larger compliant in 27 of the 40, which means for us to be taken off the gray list, we need to, we need to move the needle on another five broad areas. Uh, I am personally impressed with the work that Jamaica has undertaken to address this issue. Um, there has been a significant amount of effort placed in developing an action plan that has been filed with the FATF recently. I think it was this month, yes. Um, and at this stage, I feel comfortable that Jamaica is going to be able to buy the deadline of, I think, somewhere in 2022. January 2022 um, to be removed from the gray list. There's not much more I can say because there is a, a presentation to cabinet that is scheduled. The cabinet would have to be briefed on the scope of this action plan and what it implies. But, but I don't think at this stage that Jamaica has anything to worry about. There's been a lot of work um, in identifying the risks that we, we face from money laundering. There's been a lot of work in mitigating the risk, particularly from the uh, perspective of the supervisors of banks and of the payment system. And there's been a, a range of other initiatives across the board that, that is, will ensure that Jamaica um, is largely or fully compliant in the, in the remaining areas. So I think this is good news. Uh, there's not much what I can say until the, it, it, it becomes a matter for public consumption, but I don't think that we have anything to worry about. Great, thank you so much, Deputy Governor. I have a few questions here. A couple of them are lengthy and we have less than 10 minutes remaining. So let me just go through the next one. This is from Hubert Edwards. He asks, is the approach to stabilization too rigid in that there is not sufficiently targeted strategic investments which, create, which will create growth? This against the backdrop of a successful IMF program and no growth, which was likely costly to the taxpayers, but again, not seeing the benefits in terms of growth. Right. Thanks for that question, Hubert. Very, very um, important question. Let me just in, put it in context. The, the, the IMF program had to tackle the bulk of the problems, the major problems that Jamaica faced. And these problems really refer to um, imbalances in the, in the fiscal accounts in order to move the economy or the indebtedness of the public sector from where it was, we were at a crisis point, down to more sustainable levels. So there can be no, I think personally, apologies for the authorities in Jamaica taking a posture that we're gonna fix the big things first and then we move to the other things. There were, however, a clear focus on the part of the authorities, even while we were engaged in this process of deleveraging to ensure that the foundations of growth were not impaired by the processes that we had to go through. So, I mean, it may seem trivial, but even the fact that the central bank was set an inflation target of 5% um, is consistent with a view that while the government was deleveraging, monetary conditions had to be fostered in such a way that it would encourage growth. So it wasn't, it wasn't, a, 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 it wasn't a, 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 a focus entirely on stabilization. There were actually elements of the program that involved growth. Another element also include a range of structural adjustments uh, that agencies and uh, uh, agents of government and the central government were required to go through. I think Mr. Chung earlier said I, the, the major one that has not yet been placed in the highlight is labor market reform, but there's been a range of other reforms that have been put in place to facilitate growth. So while I agree with you that the focus of our reform programs over the past 10 or so year, years have been, and rightly so, oriented towards stabilization, uh, it may not be entirely true that the focus was entirely on stabilization. There have been other, have been other considerations. 
now that we've established with 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 you know with a lot of certainty that the institutions and the environment is relatively stable uh the next step i think is for us to put more effort once the fiscal space and once resources exist in order to address some of the more heavy problems heavy lifting in relation to um, strategic investment projects thank you thank you deputy governor another question is um how will the digital currency increase prosperity sorry i turned off my mic <laughs> that's a that's a good question uh i don't think i don't think we we have been thinking about digital currency and prosperity in the same breath. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is, is some of the benefits from the perspective of the central bank that digital currency brings with it. Uh, but by way of background, just for the purpose of the audience, you are by now, I'm sure, all aware that the Bank of Jamaica is in the process of developing a CBDC, which um, will be wholesaled, not retailed to, you know, um, everybody in the economy that will be wholesale to banks and payment service providers for them to then retail to their to their customers and to build value added services around this product. Um, the CBDC is essentially going to be a one for one replacement with currency. So all the features of the fiat money, the, the physical paper, will be reposed in the digital currency. It will be fully acceptable as a means of payment and so on and so forth. Um, by, in our view, the benefits to the CBDC are a few. One is that uh, it is meant to enhance financial inclusion um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the economy in the sense that we intend for the CBDC by design to be fully accessible um, to all stakeholders, rich and poor, and in particular, it will facilitate the ability of the public sector to engage um, with stakeholders, particularly where welfare payments are concerned, much easier. In the past, in order for the government to, to make a welfare payment to somebody in Prickapool, that person would have to incur a lot of time and energy in order to you know, go to the bank to get cash. With CBDC, they will be instantaneously credited. Their account, if they once they get one, will be, will be instantaneously credited. And to the extent that the facility exists in their area for them to use, they will be able to spend it without, without any cost. Um, so financial inclusion will be enhanced in the sense that people will now have greater access to this particular financial service. Um, what I also said imply that CBDC will 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 be will be it should be it should have or should bring with it a lower cost of transaction than original currency. Just think about the amount of time that you have to spend in the in a bank line, even if the line is to get to an ATM. All of that will be eliminated with with CBDC because transfers and so on will be instantaneous. Um, so the the benefits are really to put it in a technical term. Um, the elimination or for that matter, the reduction of frictions in transactions that will allow the people or the agents in the economy to you know, better use their time and therefore facilitate them doing other productive things. There are benefits to the central bank as well. It cost us, by our estimation, it cost us um, a significant amount of money to actually order currency, bring it into Jamaica, and then to make it available to commercial banks. With CBDC, the cost is going to be, uh, there will be cost, but the cost we expect is going to be different. So we expect to actually come out um, net positive um, after we've replaced a unit of currency with a central bank digital currency. Um, and then finally, so those are some of the benefits. Finally, it, it, all I need to say is that by our plans, we expect that the CBDC, having gone through a pilot phase between uh, August of this year and the end of 2021, we expect the general public to have access to it by the first quarter of 2022. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you to Deputy Governor. Final question, it's a bit lengthy, but I'll go through quickly. 
Bankers have suggested that the episodes of significant depreciation are largely a function of the acquisition of productive assets through these financial institutions. This signals a healthy economy, which is good. How can the FX pie be increased to satisfy the demand from the productive sectors and by extension alleviate the strain of a depreciation dollar on the ordinary Jamaican? And as a subway to that, are the BOJ swap arrangements sufficient? Are any other measures being contemplated by the BOJ? All right, very interesting question. I think I want to push back a little bit um, on the premise that you just established, however. Um, the, the premise is that the depreciation that Jamaica has witnessed in the recent past is related to the movement of capital or the movement of money. Um, and there has been, and I'm interpreting it, there has been excess demand for US dollars because of the inherent growth uh, that the, the, the system is trying, to, is trying to facilitate. And I'm here contending that there is not, from our point of view, a significant shortage um, of US dollars. I think the governor has made in several of his presentations a point that prior to the pandemic and even during the pandemic, there has been no fall off um, in daily inflows into the system. Um, so flows have remained fairly, fairly stable and demand of course is gonna be constrained by um, the available resources, but demand has not in and of itself been significantly higher for the simple reason that the, the sources of this demand have also fallen off. Um, so we have seen, for example, for fiscal year 2021, the value of imports falling off by more than $1.2 billion for the year, which suggests that you will not have a period of excess demand. Uh, in summary, um, when you look at the, the balance of payments data over the past five years, you can infer the state of demand by looking at the current account as well as with the, the excesses in the, in the financial account. Um, the current account deficit over the past five years has averaged somewhere in the region of two to 3% of GDP, um, uh, roughly $300 million per year. So that's a deficit, the excess of spending relative to the uh, current inflows into the economy. When you look at the financial account, however, you recognize that just picking one item, FDI inflows, those inflows have uh, averaged uh, about five to 6% of GDP, almost three times the size of the current account deficit, which means that if you were to abstract from the impact of FDI inflows in the current account, um, take FDIs out of the financial account, what remains of the current account is actually an economy that is, is, is enjoying surpluses on our, our current transactions. So there's no shortage, both in terms of what we observe in the, in the markets, as well as from, our, from the perspective of our national accounts, there is no shortage. So the question then becomes, why is it that the exchange rate um, is, is moving? And, and, and I'm actually thinking it through with you as we talk. Uh, if you look at the traditional explanations of, of uh, uh, exchange rate movements, you know, exchange rate movements are related to either the differential between interest rates in Jamaica and those of its major trading partners um, is not enough to compensate stakeholders for the risk that they will face of, of holding J dollars. I think you can check that. I think by design, monetary policy in Jamaica has been accommodated to the point where it is pointing to the need to make financing costs in Jamaica as low as possible to stimulate growth. However, that growth for one reason or the other has not, has not, has not yet materialized, which we are, we are fully aware of the reasons for. for. The other factor that explains uh, 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 exchange rate movement is this is growth differential. The the issue really relates to uh, how what are the alternatives that faces a portfolio holder? Can they invest in an asset in Jamaica and realize a return on it, or can they invest that same dollar in an asset abroad and realize a higher rate of return? So if the growth in Jamaica or the growth prospects in Jamaica are not um, uh, uh, comparable to those of 
what exists outside and there's going to be a natural tendency for movement of the of the of, of, of capital to another jurisdiction. I think when you look at it therefore, I would say that the 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 demand for currency really reflects the fact that the country is in a low growth cycle. And I think the challenge for us therefore is to fix the structural constraints of growth here, such that capital um, will recognize these opportunities and, and move towards them. Naturally, of course, once capital is been expended towards growth inducing projects in Jamaica, you will have that. But I think we can't say that the movement of capital now is to exploit a tremendous amount of growth potentials um, that exist currently. I think there's a little challenge that we need to fix before that explanation will be zoned with the average person. But challenges exist. Thank you for that, for that question. Deputy thank Governor, you. thank you so much for addressing all those questions. And I see there are more in the chat. I don't know if I should uh, claim moderator's privilege just to touch on one that's um, very interesting to me as well. Uh, it's a whole matter of why the BOJ chose uh, to not use black blockchain technology for its cryptocurrency. And since it didn't, briefly, can you tell us uh, what what security features are you going to put in place? Because we know hackers are active internationally. All right, thanks, thanks for that question. I think by definition, blockchain, which is a decentralized re um, register, is anathema for a centralized monetary authority. I mean, I don't think I have to say the more. The, 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 the liabilities of the central bank are best managed by a central server and not being placed on a blockchain where verification authentication occurs in a distributed ledger framework. Central banks um, need to have that assurance that it controls the issue of fiat money. And therefore, would, I, I can't envisage a central bank that is going to rely on the distribution of its, of, of its liabilities via, via blockchain, centralized um, registers are going to be the order of the day for central banks. On the issue of hacking, that question is outside of my <laughs> outside of my scope of comfort. Um, there, there are several risks that exist, not only for physical money, but also for digital money. And I think there's going to have to be a shared responsibility um, between the central bank and stakeholders to ensure that they don't lose their <laughs> they don't lose their currency, whether it is in in physical form or in digital form. But what I can say is that clearly the central bank is going to be using um, the best in terms of the technology to ensure that the encryption standards are are sound. The servers that will distribute the digital currency will satisfy a wide range of security features and the central bank will continuously ensure um, that its security systems are placed at first world levels. But at the same time, once that currency leaves the central bank, um, there's any number of risks that can face um, a, a person doing transaction. I mean, that, that, that implies that those persons are gonna have to mm -hmm. take care of their, their currency in the, with the same level of consciousness as they would take care of physical money. But rest assured that we are going to be building in first world security features into, into the system. All right, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Governor. I see Damien putting some examples of central banks who have used blockchain technology in the chat. And there are some other questions. So I'd really appreciate uh, Deputy Governor, if you could just go into the chat and maybe continue the conversation there. So thank you so much. Now we are going to move into our second presentation by Mr. Jerome Smalling from the Jamaica Bankers Association. And immediately following, we will have another question and answer session. So let me just remind everyone, please to put your, your questions and your comments in the chat as the presentation proceeds. Just before we go to the presentation, we are going to have a quick pause for this session. So we just ask everyone, please just take a few seconds and complete the poll for us.
We just have a few seconds left and we do have a number of persons that still haven't completed the poll. Please just take a few seconds and do that for us. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jerome Smalley, President of Jamaica Bankers Association. I wish to thank the PIOJ for including the Bankers Association, as well as to congratulate you on this very important forum. The Bankers Association is pleased to be a part of this event, and we hope that we will be able to provide critical information regarding the bank's impact and influence on growth in Jamaica. Jamaica's financial sector has a long and resilient history dating as far back as 1700. It has evolved to include a good mixture of commercial banks, building societies, investment brokerage houses, all of which contribute to a vibrant stock exchange in Jamaica. Financial sector and the growth agenda. Through its evolution, the sector has been a consistent driver and facilitator of economic growth, having a dual relationship with the economy, where activities from the sector impact the growth of the economy and the general economic climate impacts the sector. Jamaica, Jamaica has experienced 30 years of low economic growth and high fiscal deficit which had a significant impact on the financial sector. Particularly, the sector experienced severe challenges in the 1990s with the local financial sector crisis, FINSA, which is popularly known as FINSA, and again in 2008 with the global debt crisis, followed by Government of Jamaica, JDX 1 and 2 programs. Regardless of the challenges, the sector continues to rebound and recommit itself as a key partner to driving competitiveness, facilitating private sector growth and overall economic development. COVID-19 triggered initial impacts in the real economy, which manifested itself in a second stage throughout the financial sector. The lockdowns and social distancing measures imposed by governments around the globe to flatten the infection curves have caused significant damage to many industries, all of which are served by financial institutions. Compared to all previous challenges, including the oil price shocks of the 1970s or even the Great Depression of the 1930s, COVID-19 will likely have the most substantial impact on the global economy with a one-year reduction in worldwide GDP estimated at 6.9%. In Jamaica, GDP contracted 10.2% in 2020. As noted in many local economic studies, the lack of access to finance has been a key constraint to growth, which is mainly paid out in low penetration of credit to MSMEs and households. Uncompetitive interest rates partly due to high credit risk as a result of high information asymmetrics in the market. As part of the overall reform agenda to build economic competitiveness, the GOJ embarked on an ambitious drive to address weaknesses in the financial sector through various legislative amendments. The Credit Report Act of 2013, which established credit bureaus, reducing the information asymmetry, lowering risk, cost, and time associated with lending, the Securities Interest in Personal Property Act, commonly known as SIPA of 2013, which established the National Registry allowing movable assets used as collaterals. The Banking Services Act of 2014, which sought to encourage DTI efficiency and to establish regulatory and supervisory frameworks proportionate to the risk and activities for various financial institutions. Most recent legislation, the Bank of Jamaica Act, of 2020, 
which granted BOJ independence. We expect this will lead to greater financial deepening as the central bank will focus on the regulatory framework to maintain macroeconomic stability and provide oversight to the financial sector, as well as facilitate a more competitive, resilient, dynamic, and adaptable financial ecosystem. The GOJ economic reform program has addressed several growth constraints, such as reducing government debt, various factors that, that contributed to an uncompetitive business environment, examples simplifying incentives, tax rates, reducing the time taken to get development permits, registering a business, etc. All these measures resulted in increased business confidence and investment. Prior to COVID-19 pandemic, Jamaica showed signs of economic recovery, although growth remained low. Increased business investor confidence meant an increased demand for funding for various projects being undertaken by the private sector. The financial sector has significantly increased funding to tourism, construction, and manufacturing, as indicated by the slide, the source of which is the Bank of Jamaica reporting website. When we look at the sector's getting financing, we will notice that there is a positive correlation to growth, except the outlier, which is agriculture, which has low funding, but has seen some growth. We are actively trying to improve funding to the agricultural sector. And there's a general consensus across the banking sector that this, the agricultural sector must be addressed in the short term. COVID-19 presented significant challenges Prior to the pandemic, the Jamaican financial system held capital and liquidity positions that were sufficient for withstanding large but plausible stress scenarios. The initial shock associated with the pandemic involved simultaneous declines across asset markets, which resulted in significant encashment demands facing liquidity constraints on some financial entities. The BOJ and the FSC as the regulatory bodies of the financial sector applied various policies to help buffer the impact of the COVID-19 induced economic recession. BOJ applied prudential policies to ensure that the banking system operated with adequate liquidity. To help bolster, bolster market liquidity, the BOJ reduced the Jamaican dollar and the foreign currency cash reserve requirements of deposit-taking institution. They also instituted a bond buyback program for GOJ and BOJ securities and instituted special repurchase facilities for credit unions. The FSC implemented changes to its supervisory framework for non-deposit-taking financial institution. This involved more frequent reporting cycles for insurance and securities companies to assess early warning indicators associated with funding liquidity. The FSC also granted forbearance on investment limited limits for collective investment schemes and relaxed measures relating to large exposure limits, maturity mismatch in retail repo book and capital adequacy. COVID-19 resulted in a significant fall off in, income, in, in income and employment during the quarter immediately following the outbreak of the crisis, which has affected the credit quality of some borrowers. The, pa the past two effects of restrictions aimed at curtailing the spread of the virus elevated risk to the financial system, which in turn implies further risk to the real economy as it requires the financial sector to function normally by providing loans to the stressed sectors. Since March 2020, deposit-taking institutions have offered loan repayment moratoria to households and businesses to help manage their financial situations. Prior to the pandemic, there was a push to have risk-based know your customer requirements. The rollout of the GOJ care program and path payments saw the tiered KYC or simplified due diligence finally introduced. This resulted in thousands of unbanked entering the financial sector, which has been a very encouraging, which has been very encouraging for the JBA's 
financial inclusion efforts. A major impact of COVID-19 has been the digitization of our local financial sector. Months before the virus, we started seeing much digital innovation in the financial sector. Many fintech projects were being rolled out to improve service delivery and cut costs. We saw several banks developing mobile apps and offering a suite of online services, such as opening bank accounts online, accessing online banking to pay bills, do transfers, purchase stocks, and apply for credit. Although the financial sector is an, is an essential service, the work from home push to curtail the spread of COVID-19 resulted in a drive towards di digitization. As we move forward, it is important for us to continue to meet customers' needs and be mindful of the market segments, such as the elderly, as we adapt to the new normal. The financial system has remained generally resilient throughout the pandemic. Both the primary ratio and capital adequacy ratio, which measures the capacity of banks to absorb unexpected losses, remain comfortably above their respective statutory minimum. All banks have also remained well capitalized and in compliance with prudential liquidity standards. While the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to a softening in the financial assets and credit market performance, the financial system remained sound, profitable, adequately funded, and capitalized. Despite the negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the overall performance of the local economy, the total assets of DTIs grew by 11.8%, or $214 billion relative to an expansion of 10.6% or 173 billion in 2019. As noted, the Jamaican economy expected, estimated to have contracted sharply by 10.2% in 2020 and will continue to contract in the context of the ongoing pandemic. The domestic economy is expected to gradually recover over the next two years with, with economic activity returning to pre-COVID-19 levels by financial 2022-2023. Going forward, for post-COVID economy, economic recovery, the financial sector's role will continue to be crucial to ensure macroeconomic stability and financial support to the process especially to industries such as tourism, which experienced major contraction due to the direct impact of the virus. We stood by our clients in their worst times, which saw growth in the net loans and allowances in 2020 by 9.5% or 87.1 billion, the lowest annual growth in credit observed since 2017. We will continue to work together with the government of Jamaica to improve access to financing for MSMEs and prevent falling out of this crucial segment through programs such as the Credit Enhancement Fund, which saw 318 MSMEs receiving approval of 1.83 billion, backing 4.4 billion of existing loans. We note our PSOJ JBA Access to Finance Project which has been instrumental to addressing long-standing issues related to MSMEs getting funding. The project launched COVIDcast to lead dialogue on issues such as marketing and digitization. For post-COVID, a key element is to continue financial deepening and innovation. Significant work has been done to improve the safety and efficacy of the payment clearing and settlement framework for domestic payments. As we push to become a cashless economy, there must be an increased efficiency in electronic payments to support small businesses. Other key initiatives that should enhance the sector soon include the implementation of a reverse factoring electronic platform. Likewise, standardizing asset quality by incentivizing the use of independent credit rating. The establishment of a trading platform for fixed income securities and the establishment of a central bank digital currency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Smalling. 
Now we'll go into our question and answer period. We just ask you to open your camera and your mic. Just reminding everyone, please place your questions and your comments in the chat so that we can feel them to Mr. Smalley. As you're doing that, let me just start by asking uh, Jerome, the financial sector argues that loan funds are widely available, yet segments of the business community, especially the micro, small, um, micro and small enterprises, which are the mainstay of our economy, they lament having little or no access to funds. They can get car loans, but not loans to grow their businesses. Could you please elaborate, albeit briefly, on the role of the PSOJ, JA, JBA, Access to Finance uh, project that you mentioned um, in actually bridging that divide? Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, the governor in his presentation indicated the growth numbers in, by segment, and he indicated an 18% growth in business loans relative to a 15% growth in personal loans for the period 2019-2020. Now, what that indicates is that the AFP program has been somewhat successful because prior to that, we would have recorded more rapid growth in the personal loans uh, sector than the business loan sector. So to have business loans outstripping growth, growth in business loans outstripping growth in personal loans is a good indicator that the efforts are paying dividends. Now, the AFP program, I mean, I've been around for some time and the AFP program represents the most comprehensive effort towards affording access to finance to the MSME segment. It includes the private sector, the MSMEs themselves support uh, agencies such as the Exim Bank and the DBJ and in a collaborative effort towards uh, ensuring that we are bridging the divide. Now, prior to the establishment of this program, the, there would be somewhat of a divide between what bankers are saying. Bankers are saying, look, the, segment, the sector needs to be more formalized. They need to get registered. They need to uh, improve record keeping and uh, having formal financial statements. While the segment was saying, here we are, these things are expensive these things are difficult, can you meet us where we are? And so the program has been working towards getting uh, businesses to understand the importance of becoming formalized while getting banks to understand the language of the small businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, as well as making efforts to meet them where they are as we speak. I, I certainly appreciate that, Jerome, but we know that there's always hesitance with becoming formalized, what is what if anything is a push to incentivize um, these well, micro and small businesses to formalize? Well, well, the thing is, becoming formalized is what getting a bank loan or being able to access financial services would be a byproduct of becoming formalized. Becoming formalized is not. It's, so some of the things that are discussed in the AFP program, such as having a business plan or keeping financial records, these things are independent of actually having a banking relationship. These are good business practices. Uh, what the AFP program is driving as well is the fact that a business plan or financial statements do not necessarily have to be 50 page documents. It is, I mean, it's, it's really trying to establish uh, almost a translation of bank speak and a translation of business speak. So what is a business plan? Is it a 50 page document similar to what say a financial institution would put forward uh, in support of their own um, request? Or is it basically information on who your clients are, your suppliers, who are your suppliers, who are you selling to and what are your, your financial movements? you know, what are your seasons? What is the cycle of your business? Having very basic discussion to understand how you can speak to your bankers to say, okay, this is what the business is like, this is how it works, and this is how I'll be putting myself in a position to repay your facility. 
Thank you so much for that. I'm now going to turn over to Mrs. Gwyneth Harold Davidson, who is going to be our chat monitor for this segment. I already see some questions coming in. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Laura. Many questions coming in here from Mrs. Smalling, some broad questions, which you hope we hope you'll be able to help us to respond so that we gain some knowledge and learning. I'm going to take one from Mr. Alan Alton Brooks. And his question is, for those without access to technology at home, how will loading digital currency be delivered to them? But I'm not sure if this is specific for you, but maybe you want to respond. Well, the thing is, I believe it's, it's more um, addressed to the BOJ. However, mm -hmm. the... The, the digital currency hopefully will be launched in an environment wherein we will have greater access to, to technology uh, to the extent that, so, so the digital currency isn't in the first instance replacing regular currency. What it is hoping to do is to enhance and to give more individuals the opportunity to, to access uh, finance. And for example, uh, the, the, the deputy governor used very simple language in explaining the importance of the digital currency. Uh, so if, for example, during the, the payout of the care program, if you are living in, in, in a remote section of Jamaica, the only way you could access your care program is you would have to travel to a city center to receive that cash. The digital currency is hoping to establish an entire ecosystem wherein the, if you are, for example, in rural Jamaica, your shopkeeper will be able to access or accept your digital currency. So once that, those funds are, are, are transferred to you, you should be able to spend that similarly to, to spending cash. So you wouldn't have to get into a, a taxi or a robot, as we refer to, to travel to. Uh, uh, we, we had conversations with some of our clients in, in the Montego Bay, what, in the St. James region, who had to travel to Montego Bay. And sometimes it's it's five hundred dollars, two taxes each way, mm. uh, to try and access the funds, and, and and it wasn't a lot of money anyways. So so the digital currency is seeking to address this as well. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Mr. Chong, we know that you have a question pending, but just going to allow someone else who has not yet put in a question to make a statement from Charmaine Brim, who is um, here with the PIOJ. Uh, her comment is, and perhaps you can respond to it, she says, I believe much more needs to be done in building awareness among the SMEs about the need to formalize. They could also benefit from much needed capacity support in the preparation of a business plan and record keeping. Any response from the Jamaica business, uh, bankers about that? Well, well, well we agree. And uh, that has been our, our primary message in terms of encouraging the MSME sector to become formalized. Uh, the thing is, it will take some time. We're also encouraging our partners who are representing the MSMEs focus on assisting these individuals and these small small and medium-sized businesses through that path of, of becoming formalized. Now, the communication effort is, is ongoing, but it is a huge message to individuals in terms of, you know, why is it important to become formalized and to convince the segment or the sector that uh, becoming formalized has more advantages than disadvantages. So when you speak to the average small business or medium-sized business, they tell you, boy, you know, tax man is going to come and look at my, my things and I'm going to now have to pay taxes and I'm not earning enough to afford taxes. They are unaware of the different benchmarks in terms of when does it uh, chip in that you're required to pay GCP, which I mean, we know it's $10 million. How do we get that information across to individuals to say, look, if you're filing your taxes, if you aren't at certain benchmarks, if you are recording a loss, then these are the implications from a tax perspective. Now, we're also working with uh, partners who provide services to the segment uh, in terms of preparing financial statements to get them to better understand the, some of the financial speech. The important thing, as I indicated, and this is driven by our, our PSOJ chairman, sorry, President Keith Duncan, is ensuring that we're speaking the same language because financial language can sometimes sound overwhelming and can sometimes sound very complicated to uh, the average MSME person. So I think the important thing is, is 
that ongoing communication to the MSME segment to say, look, it is more, there are more benefits to becoming formalized than there are disadvantages. So a lot more work left to be done from several different partners. So on we go. We're going to invite Mr. Chung, if you already know, to open your mic and pose your comment or question. Thank you. Um, good morning, Jerome. How are you doing? Not bad. Um, um, Jerome, from your perspective, from where you sit, the, we've pumped a lot of money into SMEs, certainly in terms of the, the special loans. And things. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt, please. Um, Mr. Chong, we're not hearing you. If you can uh, adjust yourself so we can so you can start again now, please. Okay, yeah. So, Jerome, from where you sit, um, we've, we've pumped a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm into lending to SMEs. Um, do, you, do you think that there has been an adequate ROI on um, SME development from that money? I mean, so if you were to measure it, um, you know, in terms of the amount of money we're putting, you, you see any movement happening with that? Or you think there are some other things that need to be done first? Well, well it's, it's a very good question. I'm assuming you're referring to ROI on, on the side of the, the banks and the deposit taking institutions or those who would have been involved in the process. Uh, at the get go and at the establishment of the FP program, uh, just so you know, the bankers would have acknowledged that we are looking for short term gains. So, from an ROI perspective, we expected that in the early stages, we're helping to build out the segment. No, we're all committed because we've, we've heard hundreds of, of presentations, and I suspect Dr. King will touch on it, how important it is for the segment, which is the greatest and largest employer of, of talent in Jamaica, how important it is for it to be funded and to the extent that it could grow. So the ROE request, we acknowledge at the get-go that the returns on, on supporting this sector will not be as great as if we were to continue along the path of, of, of uh, supporting bigger businesses. But we acknowledge that if we do not support the segment, uh, we will not, Jamaica will not see the growth that, that we intend or that we, we, we hope to have in, in the near to medium term um, period. So it's uh, thanks for that response. Uh, we're on the same page as the mechanics of how to get it all moving forward faster. Now, Mr. Damian King had a question, which I'm going to ask him if he can unmute himself and go ahead and pose your sir. And while you organize this, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, Jerome, you mentioned that you were able, the bankers were able to implement the simplified KYC, which moves us toward a tiered KYC structure where you have different know your customer requirements for different you know, kinds of risks and, and different levels of, of, of customers. My question is, in implementing that so far, has there been any pushback and any challenge to your relationships with your correspondent international banks or any pushback from global regulators? Well, the short, the short answer is no, we have not had any, had any, because with the structure as well, both in terms of the amendment of POCA, as well as the stance of the BOJ, where they're moving from a rules-based structure to a risk-based structure, uh, it's well received by the correspondent banks. In fact, most of our, our senior jurisdictions are operating on a risk-based uh, uh, structure. So what it does is it gives them comfort that uh, the tiered KYC uh, will be applied in a way that the risk to the correspondent bank would be very little. Okay, we thank you for that response and for the question. I do have one more. In uh, 2020, the first, sorry, I'm start again. Is the formal financial sector simply unattractive to the unbanked, given the hoops that they have to jump through or they have to overcome, and the low savings rates that are currently in place and unacceptable source of funds that the legislation requires? What is how we how can we achieve financial inclusion with those acknowledged hoops or hurdles? Okay. <laughs> 
uh, very loaded question. However, as I indicated earlier, the amendment to the POCA Act, of 20, which occurred in November 2019, is, is going to push us or give us a, a significant boost in that regard. So the, there was a one-size-fits-all approach to, to KYC and, and onboarding of clients. So what it meant is that if a client had a, a, a low-risk type uh, arrangement whereby, let's say, for example, I'm just going to use a number, their entire interaction with a financial institution could be, say, a million dollars for the entire year. Uh, if we go back to the original idea of proceeds of crime and the original idea of, of know your customer, you could ask yourself, what were we seeking to achieve? Which really was preventing the, the formal financial sector from being used to, to fund crime, uh, primarily drugs and, and terrorism. So, so the question is, if you have clients who are operating within a, within a certain risk framework, a million dollars, two million dollars, are these clients likely involved in funding drugs or, or benefiting from drugs? Or are they likely funding terrorism at those levels? Jamaican dollars, I'm referring to. So, so that's, an in, that's in some insight into how the risk-based approach is being applied across the financial institution uh, around uh, how can we look at the risk inherent in banking a specific plan versus trying to, to, to use a one-size-fits-all. And what that has done, it has given us the opportunity to say, look, the, the hurdles are lower. The benchmark is lower. So for most banks, if not, well, I should say all banks would have launched what we refer to as a lower tiered uh, bank account, which only requires one ID and your TR uh, versus the, the original framework, which everybody had to bring two references and you had to bring proof of address and all this long list of prescribed documentation that would have been issued by the BOJ. So we're moving in the right direction and I will never sit with you and say, look, we're, we're there. Uh, it's, it's, the banks have given the commitment to work with the government and the BOJ in terms of ensuring that we have financial inclusion over time. Okay, thank you for that. Sounds very reassuring. And it goes back to the core banking principle, I guess, of know your customer. And there's no one way to know your customer. Comment from Hubert Edwards, because we have another minute and three quarters. He, his comment is that fin fintechs, financial tech, technology companies will play a big role in the delivery and we're going back again now to digital currencies, CBDC and telecoms. Any wrap up on that? Any, any comment on that again? Well, well, the thing is, they, I'll wrap up with that in saying that branch locations and physical presence is the most expensive way of delivering service. Uh, if we want it to drive financial inclusion, it is going to be impossible for us to go out doing it through the traditional branch presence framework where we're going all over Jamaica and we're building out branches and providing uh, staff components, etc. The digital is the way we are going to have to find the best way as we work with the regulators and the government and the people of Jamaica, the best way to roll out digital uh, banking in a way that people aren't excluded and that we can ob obtain our initial objective or the overall objective of greater inclusion and not necessarily um, uh, exclusion as, as is being suggested. Thanks. Thank you also for that. So again, we are hearing digital is the way and inclusion will mean different ways of operating and digital will be a way forward, which of course is gonna tie into telecoms and broadband and so on. Madam Chairman, I think we can hand over to you. Thank you so much, Gwyneth. And thank you so much, Jerome. Uh, some stiff questions there, but I see you are up to the task. And there are a few more in the chat, so I'd appreciate if you could also uh, just address those. Before we go into our third presentation, I'm just gonna ask everyone to complete this very quick poll for us on this particular session, the presentation and the discussion session. Please everyone just go ahead and fill that out very quickly. We won't have it on for very long. 
So just plug in those answers. And in the meantime, I will take the opportunity to greet everyone who has joined us since I first brought greetings. Thank you so much for being here. We are at a point where we've just finished our second presentation, but there is still more good stuff in store. So as you can see, we have the third presentation coming up now with Dr. King, after which I'll be giving my closing remarks, including some key takeaways from today's event. Just a few more seconds left. If everyone could just jump on and give us your feedback, we'd greatly appreciate that. We're also streaming live to the PIOJ Facebook page. The link is in the chat for anyone who would like to share that with their colleagues. Thank you so much, everyone, for completing that poll. And now we will go into our presentation by Dr. Damian King from Capri. Good morning, everyone. And thanks to the PIOJ for inviting me to this always important forum. I want to talk about how we can navigate what we expect to happen now in, in the economy. So we've had a pandemic, an unprecedented event. What now? This cartoon appeared in the Daily Cost US website and in a number of American newspapers. And of course, you know, it's funny. But what I think is really funny about it is the irony. The cartoon wants to make fun of the fact that while we have this, this existential event, people are worried about the economy. It's a way of, it's a way of making fun of economists. The irony is that it was the economy. The dinosaurs did not die out because the meteor landed on their heads. It wasn't the impact of the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. It was the, the dust, the volcanic dust and the, and, and the impact dust that blocked out the sun, killed the plants, and therefore the dinosaurs couldn't eat. In other words, it was the, it was the demise of the production of food that caused the dinosaurs to die out. It was, after all, the economy. So in the presence of catastrophic, catastrophic events, we actually need to pay attention to the economy. I want to talk about the, the impact, the, you know, what corresponds to the meteor strike, uh, the impact of the pandemic, the economic impact. And then what are the lessons we are to draw from it? What is the agenda of policy actions that come from those lessons? And then finally, what can we expect going forward from here? So first, let's talk about the impact. It is impossible to exaggerate how massive is the impact of this pandemic economically. The literal meaning of the word decimated, at least in, the, in its origin, in its etymological origin, is a contraction of one-tenth. That is what we have seen. When the final numbers for, for 2020 come in, we're going to see that the overall economy contracted by 10%. This makes it the largest economic contraction since Jamaica started recording economic data. Tax revenues plummeted from 
roughly $570 billion to 511. That's also a contraction of 11%, of 10%. Okay, so the one of the ways that we can compare disasters, economic shocks, is in terms of their fiscal impact. And so the economists at the research project, uh, a research organization, went back and totted up the, the fiscal cost of all of the hurricanes that have hit Jamaica in the last 40 years. And they adjusted the costs for inflation so that they are comparable over time. And we see that we have had some costly natural disasters. The big one, of course, was Gilbert in 1988, which cost more than 400 million US dollars. How does the pandemic compare to that? After only five months after the pandemic started, the cost was actually twice the most significant disaster to hit the country before this. So there is no denying that this has been a massive economic shock. Now that we are more than a year into it, it's time that we can draw some lessons. The first lesson, which we should already know, but can now appreciate, is that life is uncertain. What is more, it is uncertain in unexpected ways. At least with the hurricanes, we didn't know when hurricanes were going to hit. But we knew and we know that hurricanes are going to hit. We just don't know which year. But very few people in the world could claim to have anticipated the terrorist attack of 9-11. Look how much that has changed the world. It has changed how the world goes about conducting its business, its economic business. It has created a huge security industry. And that has actually infiltrated and impacted all, all lots of other industries. Tourism, travel, and, and, and much else. Then we had the global financial crisis of 2008. There were financial crises before, but nothing on the scale and impact of the 2008 crisis, which lasted years and clogged up the, the global financial system. It was felt in every country. And of course, the pandemic. You know, who would have thought two years ago that what would cause people anxiety is somebody walking into a bank without a mask? Something else is going to happen. We don't know when. And what is more concerning is that we don't know what is the nature of the next shock event that is going to change the world. But we know something is going to happen. Life is uncertain. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is that fiscal resilience is crucial. If you look at Jamaica's economic history, this is a time for us to be thankful because had this pandemic come along at nearly any other time in our economic history, it would have been catastrophic. Up until six years ago, we had a public debt that was more than 140% of GDP. It has steadily come down since then because of the fiscal responsibility program. Not only were we a world leading country in terms of public indebtedness, but a consequence of that was the cost of servicing that debt. 
which used to take 40% of every dollar that the government earned in revenue. That left no fiscal room to deal with any kind of disaster. Because of the fiscal reforms of recent years, that has come down now to a half of what it used to be. Up until six or seven years ago, we ran fiscal deficits. That is excess of expenditure over revenue that was more or less always around six, seven percent of GDP. And those kinds of deficits had been going on mostly uninterrupted since independence. Again, no fiscal room for the government to be able to increase expenditure or cut taxes in the presence of a crisis. Since then, we've been running more or less balanced budgets, save for rounding errors. The savings, if you will, of a country uh, is one way to describe the central bank's net foreign exchange reserves. Up until a few years ago, up until six years ago, those hovered around two billion US dollars. By the time the pandemic came along, we were above three billion US dollars. So in terms of Jamaica's economic history, the pandemic came along at a time when we actually had the fiscal capacity to respond to it. Had it come along at any previous time, we would not have had the ability to cope with it fiscally, economically. It's the second lesson. The third lesson is about the social safety net. We discovered in this pandemic that it's not much of a net. Capri has done some research shortly to be published to look at how effective was the government's social safety net, both the one that was the status quo before the pandemic and including the enormous effort that the government impressively made to set up a new architecture to be able to distribute cash to the neediest in our society. Now, the fact that they had to set up an architecture just for the purpose tells you that the social safety net was not adequate. But even with that, our survey of inner city communities and poor, poor rural communities revealed that only about a quarter of the households in those communities benefited from government assistance. And this is not because they applied and were turned down. That was true for some of them. Most did not even apply, either because they didn't know about it or because they didn't have access to a device or didn't have access to the internet. So our social safety net became exposed for its inadequacy. Those are the three big lessons. What does that tell us in terms of what our policy agenda should be from here on? Well, the first one is clearly that we need to build an effective social safety net. Two months ago, Capri published a report on the, the, the status of our social, social safety net, uh, what the problems were and how to, how to improve it. And the takeaways from that is, are the following. Our cash transfer program, PATH, needs to be unconditional. We need to remove the conditionalities that apply for somebody to be able to continue to receive their, their PATH payments. Secondly, it is too narrow and, and insufficient in terms of the amount it pays. It needs to be broader, it needs to be deeper. An important part of any social safety net is to have a universal pension arrangement because the elderly are the most vulnerable in any society. And finally, it suggests that 
the best thing we can do to prevent the vulnerable from slipping into destitution is universal health insurance, which is not even fiscally costly or, you know, to a great extent because it's an insurance scheme. People pay to be on it. Other elements of, of the policy agenda that comes out of what we have learned is that Jamaica's shift to a, fis a fiscally responsible framework seven or eight years ago has been critical. That created the fiscal capacity to respond to a crisis. More crises are going to come. We need to have that fiscal breathing room. So we need to stick to the fiscal responsibility framework, continue with the primary balance targets, the fiscal targets that can, that allow us to continue on the trajectory of debt reduction down to around 60% of GDP worth of debt, which is sustainable. Jamaica has spent a lot investing in infrastructure. That infrastructure makes the economy more resilient. That investment needs to continue. We now have a full-fledged inflation targeting regime in an independent central bank. That too is an important element of, uh, of a platform for economic growth. Those are the key points. With all of this, what are we to expect in terms of the prospects for the economy going forward? There are two lessons from history that we need to pay attention to and that are relevant to Jamaica. The first one is that a structural shift is underway. When we talk about the structure of an economy, we talk about what it produces, not how much overall, but what makes up its, its pile of production of goods and services. The disruption that the pandemic has induced is the basis of the structural shift. There's a great story about the, the terrorist bombings on the London Underground in 2005. And the London Underground, you know, has, has knowledge of what are the commuting patterns. How many people go from where to where, where they get on, where they get off. And of course, when the bombings shut down some of the underground stations, then people had to, people who would normally use those stations had to reroute themselves. The interesting thing is that after the stations reopened and a sufficient time had passed for people, for people's commuting patterns to settle down, the underground discovered that about 10% of the commuters stuck to their newly discovered route rather than going back to the routes they had before. The interpretation is that the disruption forced them to discover a more efficient route than they had been using. That's what disruptions do. And that is happening to all of us in all the spheres of our economic activity and non-economic activity. Eric Yon, who is the founder of Zoom, has pointed out that this was never the plan for Zoom. Zoom was supposed to have been a niche business product. It was never intended to be used for the meetings of the social club, of the high school, for teaching classes. The 70-fold increase in the use of Zoom over the last 14 months was completely unexpected and he had to change the nature of the product to accommodate it. This is like the commuting. Zoom existed before, you know. This is like what happened to the London Underground because after the economy is reopened and movement is unrestricted and people can travel again to meetings and to classes, the, the role of Zoom the role that Zoom is going to play in people's lives and other remote meeting and, and, and networking uh, platforms, it's going to continue at a much higher level than before the pandemic. 
we found a new way of doing something, even though the actual technology existed from before. And this kind of change is also going to pervade every aspect of society. We have discovered more capability and more efficiencies. The, this, the, the next uh, kind of you know, innovation-driven discovery uh, can, be, can be evidenced by what happened in Europe all the way back in the 14th century during the Black Death. It is thought that because of the Black Death, Europeans became more adventurous. They overcame their inertia. They overcame because, because many of the foundations of what they of what they had come to rely on changed. It made people more willing to take risk. And that was the basis on which Europeans started setting up across the seas to discover and colonize the new world. Similarly, Nicholas Christakis of Yale University has argued that what we now refer to as the Roaring Twenties really was one of the consequences of the Spanish flu of 1918. That again, you know, it made people more willing to, to, to burst out and take risks. So two things that, so, so one thing that follows from from a, the disruption of things like the pandemic is we get a structural shift. And part of that is the entrepreneurial burst of activity that tends to follow a pandemic. This is already happening. The US reports that new company registration is at an all-time high. The same information has come from the United Kingdom. And guess what? The company's office of Jamaica says the same thing about new company registrations here. The entrepreneurial burst of activity, the adventurousness that comes out of having your social and cultural foundations disrupted is already underway. This suggests, and this is second expectation, that we are entering a period of economic growth. Recessions catalyze economic growth. There are many factors that explain the Industrial Revolution, but according to historians, one of them is the cholera epidemic of the 1830s. We have a term now that we call the post-war boom. The boom of the post-war boom, again, is coming out of the disruption of World War II. And already, this too is on the way. That if you, if you look at the growth forecasts for the United States, 6% uh, has been forecast for 2021. And the growth forecasts around the world they are already at levels that exceeded rates of economic growth before the pandemic started. Jamaica, up to the point where the pandemic hit, had already established a good economic platform for economic growth. Fiscal adjustment, the infrastructure, the reduction in inflation. So we are coming out of the pandemic with what was already a good platform, that platform is still in place. Plus the disruption that creates adventurousness and entrepreneurship and frees up resources to, to be able to, to fuel that. Once we pay attention to the lessons of the pandemic, we stick to maintaining a strong platform of economic fundamentals, 
invest in a better social safety net. Then economic prospects for Jamaica for the next two to three years, four years, five years, look really good indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very clear and informative presentation, Damien. We're going to go into our question and answer session. I can't imagine there's too much confusion over what you had said, but I'm sure we have some questions for further discussion and elaboration. I'm just going to kick things off um, by saying that your presentation and even the, the governor, the governor of the Bank of Jamaica's presentation was very optimistic on the outlook for um, Jamaica's economic future within the next few years. But I just want to emphasize to everyone that, I mean, that depends on us actually learning those lessons and putting um, the necessary steps in place to actually take advantage of those opportunities. Um, now, speaking specifically to the um, importance of strengthening the social safety net that you mentioned in your presentation, and I, I believe it was also mentioned in a BOJ's presentation that remittances had increased significantly during the pandemic. Now, for some time, haven't remittances been acting informally? as a social safety net for many Jamaicans because the Jamaican government you know, hasn't been able to afford to put in place a number of the important yes, yet costly measures that you described in your presentation today. And if so, how can we actually fund the kind of reform of the formal safety net systems currently in place? You know, that's a, um, that's a really good, good and interesting comment, Laura because people tend to get concerned about how much we depend on remittances and what happens, you know, the first question people ask in, in, in many scenarios is what happens if remittances fall off? And as you're pointing out, remittances act as a social safety net over the long term and the short term. What that means is that remittances are an inverse index of how well your economy is doing. Uh -huh. Remittances tend to go up when the country struggles. And indeed, if you look around the Latin American and Caribbean region, at the countries that receive the most remittances as a share of GDP, you get the ones that have the worst performing economies. You actually get you know, the El Salvador's and the Guatemala's and, and Jamaica. Honduras. And Honduras, but not Chile, not a whole lot to the Bahamas. Mm, no. So my point is our goal for economic management is to end up with remittances going down. Um, to get to the second part of your, of, of your question, uh, putting in place a, a robust and effective social safety net is costly. One of the problems with the park program that we identified is that it doesn't reach enough people and the contribution is quite small. This comes straight out of the public purse. Uh, we have just recently, the government has just recently announced that it is in fact instituting a universal pension for those over the age of 75. Again, it's a modest amount, but it's an important beginning. there is going to be a fiscal cost. But, and of course, within our fiscal constraints, it's something to really, to really think about. But the importance of a social safety net for itself stimulating economic growth is critical. People who are vulnerable make better economic decisions when they have economic security. Rather than taking the the least risky choice in their economic decisions, the least risky choice is not necessarily the one that has the highest return. So, so to pick one example, you know, a farmer is not going to experiment with a way to improve his yield if he feels, rightly or wrongly, that there's any risk of the new technique not be, 
him not being able to feed his family. So a social safety net leads people to make better economic decisions. What is more, it creates social buy-in for the economic reforms that we have already made and have to continue to make and invest in it. So there was a payback. There was an economic payback to having a stronger social safety net. So yes, it has a cost, but it's a cost that we have to pay. And that's not even getting into the moral argument. No, no, I totally agree. It's just to have the money up front to do it, <laughs> to, to get the return on investment afterwards. Okay. Indeed. So we're going to go to, again, to Mrs. Kelly and Maury of the GIP. She's going to be giving us some questions from, for Kellyanne. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Good morning again, everyone. I have um in the comments, in the chat, comments regarding your presentation, Dr. King. Awesome presentation. Very clear, insightful, inspiring, very informative and clear as per usual. So congratulations on that. Following from your question or the answer that you just gave to Laura's question, you said the goal of economic management is to end up with remittances going down. What are your thoughts as to viewing remittances as a financial return on brain drain? Well, there is something to that. Uh, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a mitigating factor, but it remains true that it would be better for the country if those brains applied themselves here. It's interesting, by the way, one interesting anecdote um, and lesson that we can learn from other countries is that when, when, an, when a country does in fact begin to turn around and economic opportunities open up, you'd be surprised at how quickly that brain drain reverses and people start coming back. That was certainly the experience of Ireland in its economic reform in the early 1990s. That's certainly true and that is our hope. Following from the safety net question, I'll just read this from um, another another guest online given the current fiscal constraints which have exacerbated which have been exacerbated by the covid-19 pandemic how will the government fund the anticipated increase in path allocations funding is always an important question and and uh, people people like myself always ask that kind of question in response to sort of glib proposals to do this and do that so the question is, is, is important and deeply appreciated. Take a note though, of the fact that when a crisis, when the pandemic happened, the money had to be found anyway and had to be distributed in less efficient and less effective ways than if we had had that social safety net in place that the government had to establish a new architecture. It ended up going to the ones who could be reached through that architecture. And our survey shows that it missed three quarters of the neediest. So, so bear in mind that what we're talking about here is simply having a more efficient way of doing what there was a large consensus that, that, that we really ought to do. Having said that as well, we can we can make progress by you know what you notice in that chart that i showed of how tax revenue went down from 569 billion to 511 billion last year because of the pandemic is how tax revenues were consistently increasing because of the economic reforms and the fiscal reforms that had been put in place and the pretty decent work that has been taking place at tax administration. So what Jamaica had been experiencing before and will continue to experience is a fiscal dividend from the reforms it has put in place. What is really being proposed here is that some of that fiscal dividend be applied to the social safety net. So much of it will come out of increasing revenues. Thank you for that, Dr. King. From 
Herbert Edwards, Hubert Edwards rather. Dr. King, you outline a clear transition from pre-crisis to disruption to turnaround. I'm heartened by your structure and the structure of your presentation and the optimism. What though is a point of caution um, relates to what are the potential existing weaknesses that could result in Jamaica not exploiting the post-disruption opportunities? Uh, you know, one of the, well, there are two, there are two risks, there are two challenges. One we all know about, which is crime. And this is not, this is not a, a, a stab at the, the current administration. Nobody really seems to know what to do about crime and violence. So, so we're not quite sure where that is going to go. And it is, it is widely appreciated that that is a huge constraint. So that's one. But here's another one that is more disturbing. When we, you know, Jamaica has become literally the model and beacon of fiscal and governance turnaround in the Caribbean over the last 10 years. When you speak to people in Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, you hear how much they have been impressed by and inspired by what Jamaica has done. But it does beg the question, what caused that to happen? Up until 10 years ago, we were exactly the opposite. You know. We had a dozen years of being the most, one of the most indebted countries in the world with the highest cost of debt service in the world. And we continue to just muddle along. You know, we continued to actually consistently make economic decisions that made the problem worse. So it raises the question, how did we wake up one morning 10 years ago and find economic Jesus? And the truth is that question, certainly in terms of my having thought about it long and hard, I don't have a good answer. I don't have a good answer for why the electoral logic of promising irresponsible fiscal management and the repeated success of that kind of politics has really come to an end in Jamaica. So I think there, there remains a danger with every election coming up that the party that makes the most irresponsible fiscal promises and then is obliged to deliver on it is going to be successful. Ah. Food for thought. Thank you, Dr. King. There are several questions here. Where do I even turn my head? I um, Great presentation, Dr. King. This is from Kurt Davis. Much to chew on. Given the other constraints we face, is Jamaica poised to utilize this disruption? And what signs do you see that we can effectively do so? This seems to be a follow on from this very question that was asked before. Do you have anything further to add? Yes, I think what makes me think Jamaica is poised to actually take advantage of it is where we had gotten to before the pandemic. Up until the beginning of last year, one could defend the claim that Jamaica had the greatest prospects for economic growth of any country in the region, simply because of the reforms that had been put in place the economic stability, the fact that many of those reforms had become institutionalized and therefore difficult to undo, like an independent central bank and inflation targeting. Uh, infrastructure development can't be undone quickly. I mean, you can halt it, but then you still have the roads and the highways. So with all of that, Jamaica was poised for strong economic growth. Uh, that platform remains in place, you know. So as we 
as we come out of the restrictions of the pandemic, I think that tells you that, that Jamaica is already in a good position to take advantage of the opportunity. And the opportunity created by the disruption that we wouldn't have bought if it had been offered to us, but since we have it, we're going to, have to, we're going to take advantage of it. Thank you, Dr. King. And following from that point, it is true that life is uncertain in unexpected ways and that the Jamaican economy has feared the pandemic, the pandemic relatively well. Please elaborate on the extent to which you are confident that our quote unquote foundations are sufficiently agile and adaptive to withstand future shocks. Well, um, that is that is going to, no, I, I don't want to say that I am confident because one of the dangers I just spoke to, one of the risks is it really depends upon future administrations continuing to be fiscal responsible. You need to have that, you know, the point I was making is had this pandemic come along five years ago when, when debt service alone was eating up four out of every $10 of tax revenue, the government would not have been able to respond with the epidemic, with the pandemic control measures, would not have been able to respond with the cash support. And all, both of those would have made the economic consequences and the epidemiological consequences catastrophic. So I can't say with confidence that this good fiscal management is going to continue. Um, so that is something that all of us need to watch and all of us need to call out because, because we're only going to really pay the price for that when the next crisis comes along. So we need to continue that good fiscal management. The other thing that put us in a good position was the Ministry of Finance had established only the year before, for the first time, a contingency fund. That is money set aside precisely for when a crisis hits. Now, not enough time had passed for that contingency fund to have become sufficiently capitalized, but at least it was there and there was money to be drawn upon immediately. So that needs to, that needs to continue as well. We appreciating that we are a vulnerable country in an uncertain world means that we need to have a good, strong, well-capitalized contingency fund for when the crisis does come along. Thank you for that, Dr. King. A question here from Chenille. Knowing all the history and the uncertainty of our economy, is there a foresighting committee stroke organization in Jamaica, a national group that makes predictions for the next five years or so that we can plan for these uncertainties you referenced? Well, I am not sure it really needs a foresighting committee. Uh, all it needs is the recognition of our actual experience that economic shocks come along. Um, you know, economic shocks used to be just volatile oil, not just used to be, used to include volatile oil prices because we were, we are an oil dependent economy. Not to mention the hurricanes, not to mention the global economic shocks like, you know, rising international interest rates and us being indebted. So things happen. That's all we really need to know. So to realize that a country like Jamaica, more so than a country like the US, more so than a country like China, needs to take fiscal and economic resilience more seriously than they do. Understood, thank you. Coming back to the question, time back to a question raised earlier. This is from our second presenter, Jerome Smalling. Dr. King, many individuals see remittances as earnings from talent exportation. Do you have a view on the economic benefit of keeping talent versus exporting it? Well, it's an empirical question. You know, we, uh, it's an empirical question. And I think that 
the, the weight of opinion, even if slightly, is that the return on that talent being here is greater. But it remains true that it's a return on investment in talent. Uh, and that talent ends up being rewarded more privately for being in a more productive economy. And, 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 and so, I mean, that's true. So, so it, it, does, it does mitigate our lament over, over the brain drain. Thank you. Do you recall the comments raised by Dennis Strong earlier? I was wondering if you could address that no and tie to that is or was a question from Lincoln Bailey asking what specific labor market reforms are needed? Well, I mean, the person who raised the, the, the question about labor market reforms need to say what labor market reforms that, that, that they are concerned about. But in general, economies can better take advantage of any economic opportunities by being more flexible. And there are two factor markets. Factors are things that go into production. There are two factor markets for which flexibility is important. The labor market is one of them. You need labor to be available for new and expanding industries. And so you don't want a labor market where labor ends up being tied rigidly to where they happen to be at the moment. You don't want to make it too expensive and too costly for firms to downsize because then you're not freeing up labor for firms that want to expand. One of the reasons, paradoxically, one of the reasons why, and I referred in my presentation to spurts of economic growth that tend to follow deep recessions. One of the main reasons for that is that recessions free up productive factors that it creates idle workers and idle capital that can go into, that can, that makes it easy for industries that want to expand and new ideas to be able to draw on those resources. The second factor market alluded to just now in which flexibility is important is the credit market. The ability to get loans to finance a business and that's a, that's, a, that's a factor market that tends to be quite rigid in Jamaica, referenced earlier in this very forum, because it's very easy for incumbent businesses and the ones with established business relationships to get capital. For a small, for a small enterprise just getting into the business, don't have a credit history, uh, it's much more difficult. Thank you, Dr. King. Laura, you had a question? Yes, I'm going to ask Mr. Mark Tracy to just open his mic and camera. He has a, a quick question for you, Damien. Mark. Hi, good morning. So, well, I think I'm having an issue with my camera. Uh, Professor King, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. I'm okay, more. great. Um, I'm always I'm always glad when you're presenting. I, I think your your thoughts and your approach in terms of looking at a situation, a 360 degree approach is is one that is is needed in, in Jamaica in terms of looking on how we can build out our economy. Um, around the, the 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 look on you know restructuring our economy and uh, of course by uh, looking on the thrust towards MSMEs and what they can do. Um, what are your thoughts in regards to how digitization will play an import a part in in terms of the the you know post um, pandemic boom um, that you're you're you know looking on it from an optimistic standpoint? What are your thoughts on that? And and of course you know bearing in mind the the issues that we have with our broadband um, infrastructure in Jamaica. Okay. Uh to speak to the dimensions and the extent to which digitization, which is a very broad term, um, can, can affect the economy, would itself be another whole presentation. But so I will answer in just general terms so as not to take up all, all, you know, all the time with this. Um, that 
Digitization is generally about reducing transaction costs. It's about everybody having more information and everybody being able to. Digitization is reducing many economic transactions to just the movement of digits across the internet. And that makes the movement faster, more efficient, uh, and, 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 and seamless and less costly. And whenever you're, whenever you're reducing transaction costs, then you're at the very same time, the flip side of it is that you're expanding your ability to produce more with the same resources. So wherever you apply digitization to, you're going to get that benefit. This is why a national digital identification system is so important. This is why central bank digital currency is so important. It is just expanding the ways in which we can transmit information and there are huge efficiencies to come from that. Thank you for that, Dr. King. I have a question here from uh, Mr. Hibbert. Thanks for your presentation, Dr. King. Could you comment on how the pandemic has impacted Jamaica's trade and how trade fits into the growth trajectory for, forecasted? Well, you know, luckily, when the pandemic started, we had dire expectations about the, what the effect would be on, on global trade, that we had expected it to be far worse than it turned out to be. It did impact trade to, to some extent, but not anywhere near as much, um, sort of on a global level uh, compared to what we expected. So trade pretty well held up, which is important. Coming out of the pandemic, people are using the fact of the pandemic and its effect on supply chains in particular industries to want to retreat from global supply chains to, to build in some kind of resilience in particular industries. Fine, but, but the efficiencies to be had from taking advantage of global supply are just too great. And so we expect global trade to, to resume expanding and it's really important that Jamaica continues to be a part of that because, because international trade is much more important to small economies than it is to big ones that can take advantage of, of you know, division of labor and specialization within their large borders and their large populations. Much more difficult uh, for small countries to do that. I'll tell you, there was, a, there was a reference earlier in this forum to trying to push Jamaica towards economic diversification. You know, small Caribbean countries, in which I include Jamaica, have been talking about diversification, you know, for the last half a century. It's not going to happen. There's a limit to which you can have a diversified economy when you only have 3 million people and a small amount of square footage. You know, you, you, your diversification, it is, it is no surprise that the richest Caribbean countries by far are the least diversified. That when you take advantage of what is your niche, you have the greatest prosperity. So that's a trade-off we can't get away from. And, and we need to just try and manage. Barbados and the Bahamas, by the way. Hmm. Thank I you, Dr. Want, I just want to stick up in right there to say that we did have a forum just last month in this series on diversification for growth. I would encourage everyone to take a look at that link. I believe we had sent it out. And there are some interesting suggestions there that do include the use of disruptive technology, um, which, you know, digitization would fall under. Yes, Kellyanne, I think we have time for one more which, question. Which, 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 by the way, Laura, mm -hmm. leads to diversification as much as it leads to specialization in different activities. Well, yeah, that can be a part of diversification as no, well. That's not diversification. If you find a niche in a particular area and you, you bring it up to a higher level where you are supplying um, at a higher level up the chain to a specific niche market that maybe we're not doing right now, then that would increase um, income supplies, wouldn't it? You know, income no, into Jamaica. It, it would increase income, but it would shift resources into that niche. So you end up being still specializing and narrow, but just in something that is that is more productive. 
But but isn't there a lot? Aren't there a lot of resources that can be freed up? It's not necessarily that they have to be shifted, but that we need to engage. To, I to about that. you don't think so? I don't know about that. But, but you know, before the pandemic, our unemployment rate was down to seven percent, which is probably structurally as low as it can possibly get. Mm. I mean, given how we define unemployment. Right, exactly. I was just saying, given it's for persons who are actually seeking employment. So. Well, no, given it's, 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 it's a little broader than that, but it's also mm. a, a, lot of the, a lot of that remaining 7% are people who are really structurally unemployed. Mm. It would be difficult for them to be productive in any capacity. I see. Okay, understood. Kellyanne, I think we are over time, but there's so many questions. We're just going to try and, you know, get one more in before we move on. Sure. Uh, Francis Wade has a question for you, Dr. King, regarding the underground economy. Uh, are you, do you have a value or current value for the underground economy? Have you estimated one? And how does that factoring into economic planning? Uh, I mean, we, in terms of my, my, my organizations, haven't done any work on that recently, but, but figures between 40 and 50% have been banded about for some time. What, what is, if there was a takeaway of any discussion <coughs> about the informal or underground economy, it is this. We talk about the underground economy in the same way we talk about the, the cockpit country, as if it is an, in, an inherited, unchangeable physical feature. And it is important to recognize, and this is stealing the work of, of, of my friend Santiago Levy um, from the Inter-American Development Bank, that the underground economy is a sector that results from economic choices, just like the tourism sector and the financial sector. So the question we need to ask is, why is it people choose to be in the informal sector? And the answer to that is that our economic policy framework incentivizes people to be informal rather than formal. In an economy like the US, the advantages of being formal exceed the advantages of ducking the authorities. In Jamaica, it's the other way around. So until we change some of our economic policies, until we change some of the, some of the in, encumbrances upon the labor market, for example, then we will continue to incentivize people to be informal and we can change those things. Thank you, Dr. King. I have several more questions, but I understand I'm out of time. So over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Kelly. I know you really did not want to stop, but we are running behind and you know we are normally quite precise about our time and we value everyone's time here. Damien has been very active in the chat, so I'm sure he will enter the chat and answer some of those other questions while I do these closing remarks. So I'm, I'm just going to run into some closing remarks and we'll be doing some uh, key takeaways for you as well. Seeing that you've stayed the duration with us, I assume that you will agree that today's presentations and our ensuing discussions. Oh, thank you, Janielle. I totally forgot, sorry, in my rush, asking everyone again to just fill out that poll, but I will proceed in the meantime. Thank you. Yes, I hope that you will agree that the discussions and the discourse on a whole today have been useful. The aim was to shed light on the measures already implemented and those that are further recommended to effectively strengthen the Jamaican economy's long-term resilience and growth. No matter your sector or industry, we hope that you clearly recognize and are roles to play your part in this process. We do have some key takeaways for you today. So the situation, as we heard uh, from 
both the governor of the Bank of Jamaica and from Dr. King is that we do have, and I, I think Jerome touched on it as well, there's an optimistic outlook that even though this has been the greatest shock that Jamaica has really experienced, we are also poised and we're already seeing signs of recovery um, to rebound more quickly than we have ever done before to any other shocks. The lessons from the experience. As Damian mentioned, we do not know when or how shocks will come, but they will come. So resilience is crucial. The pandemic also highlighted areas of strength. Um, before, Jamaica was better prepared from a macroeconomic standpoint and during the, BOJ, um, the BOJ's policy responses as well as the DTI's measures made a difference. It's also exposed though weaknesses, but weaknesses that are opportunities to remove certain impediments to growth such as the need for greater financial inclusion. We touched on access to finance, the inadequacies, inadequacies of the social safety net and the need to significantly increase digitization or as we had discussed um, during our forum, the technical, technological implementations um, within the public and private sector services in Jamaica. The pandemic is also causing, as we can already see, innovation that will remain after the crisis has ended. We're also seeing a boom of entrepreneurial activity locally and internationally, which augurs well, not only for recovery, but for strong economic growth in the next two to three years, if we seize the opportunity. The maintenance of so policy initiatives, we discussed at length today how important it is to have that solid foundation um, with our economy. So maintenance of price, financial system, and fiscal stability uh, must remain the foundation of Jamaica's resilience and growth. Sorry, Jan, if you could just back up one. I wasn't quite finished, right? Uh, the GOJ needs to build upon that foundation with legislative and administrative amendments. We spoke about some structural changes as well uh, to improve the productivity. So labor market reforms and continued infrastructural investments, which also drives growth and improvement of the social safety net that we've also discussed. Financial deepening, product and service innovation and improved access to finance should be used to drive post COVID-19 recovery and growth via the private sector. So just to touch briefly on, just to touch briefly on some of the points that came out of our previous two Fora, which apply here. So we've we've spoken a lot about, you know, productivity of labor and how we can, uh, you know, drive growth through access to finance and, you know, aiding the MSMEs, etc. Uh, so just wanted to reiterate some of the areas that came up during our discourse throughout this series that we should have as priority areas. And as you can see, as we had mentioned the last time. Uh, their agriculture, agro-processing, global services, AKA, you know, BPOs or KPOs, um, logistics, uh, particularly distribution, transportation, et cetera, and renewable energy. So these are some of the either key or emerging areas that we really see as being key areas for focus that could drive the economic growth post-COVID. We're going to ask everyone now, again, this is a poll for our overall forum today. If you could just take a few moments, we would really appreciate if you could take a few moments and complete this for us.
So to answer some questions in the chat, we will be sending out some of these presentations as well as a link to the recording of this event and our previous two events, as well as the key takeaways from today's forum. We have some other questions in the chat that we hope we'll be able to address, but I'm going to know once we have wrapped up, which we have our forum poll, I just wanna take the opportunity to do a quick vote of thanks to everyone who made today possible. So all that remains for me now is to express sincere appreciation on behalf of the PIOG and especially my GIP team to all who made today's forum and indeed this entire series of fora a reality. Our thanks to our Director General, Dr. Wayne Henry for bringing the opening remarks each day uh, that really set the stage for each of our proceedings. We thank Mr. Richard Biles, Mr. Robert Stennett, Mr. Jerome Smalling, and Dr. Damian King for taking time out of their very busy schedules to develop, present, and expound upon this very interesting and informative presentations that were made today. Thanks also to our technical team members, Mrs. Odine Cole Phoenix, Mrs. Gwyneth Harold Davidson, and Ms. Kim Hofat for the logistical work much hard work put in behind the scenes led, leading up to this moment. And to our behind the scenes support team members, Ms. Kayan Robinson and Ms. Trishana Berger today, thank you so much. We also must say we appreciate the other PIOJ units and divisions who have supported us throughout the series, including the ISU, Communications and Marketing, the DGO, Vision 2020 Jamaica, Vision 2020, Vision 2030 Jamaica, the SDGs uh, Secretariat, Foundations for Competitiveness and Growth, and the Improving Climate Data and Information Management Project. It truly has been a you know, concerted team effort within the PIOG, and we really appreciate you. And I personally must thank Ms. Janelle Green and Mrs. Kellyanne Murray for all their hard work throughout the planning and the execution process for this entire series. And finally, it's left to me to thank each of you in attendance today. We truly appreciate your presence, your questions and your insights, all of which were meaning, you know, meaningfully contributed to today's dialogue. Together, we can make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. Please join us again, God willing, in April 2022 for our next annual Economic Growth Forum. Thank you all. Please stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day.